Matt Chat, episode 175, featuring the fourth and final part of my interview with the Quest for Glory designers Lori Ann and Corey Cole. In this part of the interview, we talk about Quest for Glory 5, the game that could have been a masterpiece, but instead didn't quite live up to the expectations of the gamers or the game designers. Uh, we'll take a look behind the scenes to see what happened there. We'll also talk more about the Hero U uh, Kickstarter project, uh, which was successfully funded. Uh, you'll get to hear more about the uh, design of that game and the plans that Lori and Corey have for us. A lot of great stuff in this uh, segment, so without further ado, here is Lori Ann and Corey Cole. What was that exasperation with this process that brought you to Legend Entertainment for the well, actually, we got Shannara game? We got our contract canceled. Uh, uh, it was funny because uh, uh, Ken Williams had said, okay, you know, job security, you know, we're going to sign a, uh, a three game contract with you and we're going to commit to you. And, uh, you know, the first of these games will be. Uh, 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 Quest for Glory 2, 4 was the first one? Yes, was, yeah, Quest was the first, for Glory 4. It was the first one of a three-game contract, and we're making this commitment to you. And uh, uh, the game shifts, and he says, and I get called into uh, uh, Mark Hood, the, uh, uh, the uh, engineering director's office, and he says, well, the company has said that uh, we need to uh, uh, cut our budgets. We're spending too much money in these games, and so you need to cut the budget by 20%. Uh, and... It hadn't occurred to me that Mark actually and management had no idea how much we had actually spent on the game. They were assuming that all games were made alike, and they didn't know that we had run a very lean top ship, and that our game was already costing probably 30% less than any other Sierra game. And I looked at Mark and I said, there is no way. Uh, we could we, make the next game in the series. Yeah, because uh, it had been, I think, $750,000 is uh, the actual cost of uh, Quest for Glory uh, 4, and I said, we cannot make our planned Quest for Glory 5 for $600,000. Now, Mark didn't have a number like 600000 He was assuming we'd spend a million or a million and a half. And so when he said a 20% cut, he was really saying, cut back to what we would actually spend. Uh, but he didn't know that. And, and we and, didn't know it. Yeah, we didn't know it. So I said, we can't do a game for that. And so then the next thing is we had the meeting with Ken Williams saying, well, so I'm sorry, but we're not going to do this game. Uh, so we were out in the street, our, uh, our job security, poof. So much uh, of that contract. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cancellation clauses, none. We got nothing. Uh, and so we had a uh, scramble. I went to work for uh, Bob Heitman, who I worked with at Sierra, who had started his own company. Uh, and uh, what was that a little later? I guess, yeah, I guess we, did, to say, say, yeah, I did. we had Bob Heitman and as a group. We went to Legend Entertainment. Legend Entertainment, of course, was Bob Bates, who was a great adventure game play, uh, So actually, bef yeah, before that happened, I worked with uh, Bob on a project that was uh, actually under contract to Microsoft. And uh, we were developing uh, uh, what became their uh, game network, uh, where they had uh, chess and uh, uh, bridge and some other games up there. Uh, we did the first version of that. They ended up going with another company for that. And our project got bought by a third company. Uh, but... Uh, you know, we got that out as one of the very first online games, uh, as a uh, multiplayer game. Uh, and then we talked to Bob Bates at the Computer Game De uh, Developers Conference, and uh, it was a mutual admiration society. You know, we really liked what Bob had to say about games. Uh, his favorite phrase was uh, designer genes. You either have them or not. And uh, if you're born with the designer genes, then you know how to design a game. Uh, and that, of course, completely contradicts our belief in uh, uh, learning now, but uh, at the time, you know, we said, yeah, you know, uh, you, you can either do it or you can't, uh, and uh, we can, and so uh, Bob said, okay, let's uh, give us uh, 10 ideas for games you want to do, and we wrote a paragraph each on 10 games we were very excited about, and as we discovered is the norm in the industry, uh, he said, yeah, those are really good ideas, you guys are creative, and here's the uh, license we have to do uh, Shannara uh, with the Terry Brooks game. Uh, <laughs> And so we did Shannara instead. <laughs> All right then, uh, but the coming to the back to the Quest for Glory Five. Huh? So the, you had mentioned a letter writing campaign, a lot of pressure from the fans to make another one. So and Sierra had something worked out. Uh, Sierra had moved up north. Uh, basically, Ken Williams and company all went went north. I guess in the middle of uh, was it uh, three. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the time. No, no, no. It's during four. Cool. Yeah, they weren't there until uh, they were still in Oakhurst okay. during four. All right. Part so of immediately four. after Quest for Glory Four, while we were off doing uh, the uh, uh, 
the board games and uh, Shannara, uh, the company decided that they could not attract uh, top uh, management or marketing talent because nobody wanted to move this to the small town in Oakhurst. Or to be more realistic, they moved to a state that didn't have income uh, state income tax. So yeah. they were moving there because they... Uh, Ken Williams wanted to keep more of his uh, income. So therefore they moved... Oh, I didn't say that. Yes, it moved more <laughs> of the company up north. And what was left behind were this this remnants of, of what Sierra had been. And they brought in a new manager, and so the whole company was, was effectively changed by then. And they had one property of Sierra's here at, in Oakhurst still, and that was the Realm. Now, the Realm was their uh, multiplayer game. It was a massively multiplayer yes. uh, fantasy game. Which consisted of going around and beating up rabbits or something. That was the extent of the storytelling that they had with the realm. You yes. got experience points, and you got to go up levels, and you got to beat more rabbits or whatever it was. So uh, Craig Alexander, the new general manager, uh, called us in, and uh, oh, me in because you oh, you were in. I was in that the Bay too, area. Excuse me. No, you were you were in the Bay <laughs> okay. Area at that time, and they called me in and said, "We want to do a realm. We want to put roll a, a story into the the realm." And we were thinking of actually, we have Quest for Glory. We could put Quest for Glory, make the realm the Quest for Glory multiplayer game. Yeah, it's Quest for Glory online. So that sounded pretty good. And you know, I didn't have any problem with it. I could make a multiplayer game. But the more we talked about the yeah, realm we, and with the groups, the more it was clear that they're going to have to rewrite the realm entirely because it wasn't designed for anything like this. Yeah, so we said, uh, you know, what do you have for quests so far? And they say, well, we're planning to putting in some quests. So they had a game that was basically uh, already out the door, already shipping, and all their effort had gone into combat and movement and, you know, technology and they had not done anything for a questing engine. Uh, so they had no capability of, of rebranding it. They had no capability of turning it into a Quest for Glory game uh, without, as Lori said, a, a virtual complete rewrite. And we said, well, it's a good idea, but uh, we don't see how you can do it. Uh, but, you know, that got us back in the radar. And so then they came in and said, uh, well, we've had, uh, you know, thousands of letters and emails from fans uh, that, uh, you know, say, please bring back Quest for Glory. Do Quest for Glory 5. We've been looking for that. And, uh, you know, maybe uh, we can get you in to do that uh, game of the series. And so uh, 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 at this point, I had moved back from the Bay Area. No, well, no, no I'm sorry. No, I hadn't, actually. Yeah, I hadn't even moved out there yet. Uh, we had a huge decision point uh, because I had this job offer for a lot of money to go out to, uh, to this Bay Area company. Uh, and then I had Sierra that... Uh, kind of wanted to do this game, but couldn't commit to it. They were not willing to say for sure uh, whether we would actually do the game or not. They wanted us to work for three months on and then, then make a decision. And I said, you know, we kind of have to pay our bills. Uh, and I don't know that, that I can work on that basis. So we compromised of uh, Lori stayed here in Oakhurst uh, and did the prototype with them. I went out to the Bay Area company. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and Sierra did pick up the game and, and sign an agreement with Lori. Uh, and uh, close to a year into it, uh, I had decided the, uh, the job in the Bay Area was not working out. I'd moved back to Oakhurst. Uh, and they said, well, we need a little help. Uh, we're you know almost ready, but we're not quite sure if, if we can make Christmas. So can you come in on a uh, you know, short-term contract to finish off the game? And I said, oh, of course. And... I came in and I discovered that what they meant by not quite being ready is that they had done the same thing as the realm. Uh, they had uh, they worked in the multiplayer aspects? Uh, they had characters that could walk around. The uh, lead programmer had created a, a wonderful 3D voxel engine uh, that uh, you know gave a unique look to the game, uh, and uh, they had some you know wonderful background art and so on. And Lori had, at this point, written 500 pages of design notes in her design Bible, and nobody in the team had looked at it. Uh, it hadn't been touched. So what they had was a game engine, 
which was where we started on Heroes Quest 1, is they had a million dollars put in the game engine before we did Heroes Quest 1. Well, here they had spent a year developing the game engine, and they thought they were about to ship the game. Nobody had actually looked at the game design. Uh, so I said, I don't think we're going to get this out in two months. In fact, I don't think you're going to get this out in January. There's a little bit of work that needs to be done. So I, I came on, and my little short-term project turned into a long-term uh, two-year project. Two-year two project, and I worked with the lead programmer to come up with a uh, scripting language, scripting engine, uh, and we had had a team of programmers that were had worked in the old uh, SCI games, which was a Sierra's in-house language. Uh, the new game was being done in C++. Well, it turned out that the programmers had asked to be sent to C++ seminars for training. And the company had decided that was too expensive and hadn't done that. So we had a room of application programmers who had no clue how to program in the language the game was written in. They had done nothing for the last uh, six months. Uh, they were on salary. They were against the budget. <laughs> and it was like, disaster. Okay, talk about reinventing the wheel again. And then? So I started writing prototypes and then had to train them. And then this was like a year into the project. The only thing we had to offer in a year was this this uh, demo thing that yeah. we got a multiplayer demo. And see, the game at that point was supposed to be multiplayer. Um, so therefore, the design was for multiplayer at that stage. But we did get an absolutely astonishing soundtrack. That was the only th person who could actually do their part. The programmers couldn't do their part. The artists were stymied because they couldn't do things. But we had a musician, and that musician gave us the soundtrack. And it was like, my gosh, this was the first really true, full sound soundtrack. Yeah, or orche orchestral movie orchestral. level soundtrack. And in fact, he went. Uh, Chance, Chance Thomas. Thomas went over and got an orchestra to do some of the, the that music for it, and it was like, oh, you see, as we said, roller coaster. The big <laughs> high of the first year was getting to hear the music the way it should sound, and with a person who actually was trained formally to be able to create an orchestral uh, 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 soundtrack. So it was like. Wow! It was just incredible. And uh, Chance actually uh, later was uh, very influential in getting uh, game music recognized for Grammy Awards and Academy Awards. Uh, that uh, up until then it was like you know games, you know they're they're for kids, and they go beep boop bop, you know. Uh, but obviously, you know, Mark Siebert, uh, we, you know, we were blessed with great musicians all through the uh, series. Uh, Mark Siebert. Uh, with the tools he had for the first game, uh, made an amazing soundtrack, but only probably 5% of our players ever heard it because it was designed for the uh, Roland MT32 and LAPC1. Uh, and most of our people were playing uh, at best on a sound blaster and at worst on the uh, uh, the PC squeakers. Uh, and they couldn't actually hear the nuances of that, uh, you know, that music. Uh, but uh, Chance was the first time they brought the musician in from the beginning. And a lot of that had to do with our producer on the fifth game uh, was himself a musician. Uh, and so he made sure that music was a major part of the game. Yeah, and because that was the only part that could actually work on something. So we had this great soundtrack year one. Year two, Corey comes on and we start to get the game going and then find out that these yeah, we, yeah, voxels we, that we were using, this this way of programming for these characters, uh, when your character got close to the screen, the screen rate became like this. <laughs> and so you couldn't move the character when it got big on the screen. It wasn't quite that bad. It was, I think, uh, 1.7 frames per second. <laughs> it was pretty bad. Uh, Sierra, now I don't know whether it would, work, would have worked out differently, but uh, uh, Sierra has always okay. had it. Anyway, uh, Sierra has always had a not invented here uh, uh, philosophy. They, uh, and actually the great strength of the early SCI games was that they did come up with a game engine that could be used for all the games. Uh, in this case, uh, we had looked at voxels from another company, a Russian company, uh, that uh, was licensing it for fifty or $100,000 dollars. 
Uh, and our lead programmer said, you don't need to pay that much. I can do, you know, I can do this in two weeks. And in fact, he did. He was, you know, Eric Lengiel, a brilliant uh, programmer. Uh, he later uh, went on to uh, create his own 3D game engine uh, that, uh, that he's been selling commercially. And then he went to Electronic Arts. Uh, but Eric did the voxel uh, engine uh, within a few weeks. Uh, and it looked really good. The problem is that it, it did not deal with large objects, close-up objects, well. And so two years into the project, the second time we thought we were going to ship for Christmas, uh, we discovered that we couldn't do it, that the art didn't work. And so uh, the artists had to go back and take all of their uh, 3D art, and uh, Eric now spent another three or four weeks uh, writing a, uh, a traditional 3D graphics engine, uh, with all the vectors and so on. Uh, and uh, we were able to use these scanned in artwork, but they had to, uh, 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 you know, basically run it through a conversion process uh, to turn it into polygon art. And yeah, it needed a lot, of, Everything, a lot of work. All the art had to be redone. It was all redone now as polygon art, and it hadn't been before. So every artist had to take what they'd done, redo it, all of the backgrounds, the programming for the room was totally different. So the whole game was reinvented for the third year. Yeah, that was one of our big adventures on Quest for Glory 2, uh, because that was the first game we had uh, done with uh, scanning in the artwork and working from scans, is that all the artwork was originally done as pencil sketches. They scanned in the pencil sketches, and the programmers then worked with that. Uh, well, the problem is that the programming in a Sierra game is very, very tightly specified. Uh, you say, move this character to location 17, 128 or whatever, uh, uh, which all worked fine uh, when things were done with the, uh, you know, the hand-drawn vector art. Uh, but when it was scanned in, well, what they did is they didn't paint over it on the screen. They really painted. These were real artists. Uh, and they took the pencil sketch and they made a painting of that pencil sketch and then scanned in the painting. Well, inevitably, uh, when you go from a pencil sketch to a painting, things are not at the precise pixel coordinates. Everything moved by a few pixels here, a few pixels there. Sometimes the artist enhanced it a little bit by uh, changing uh, some of the, uh, uh, the objects in the scene. Uh, and when the programmers got back to it, none of our programming worked. We had to rewrite all the programming to work with the new art. Uh, so that added a good two months to the uh, Quest for Glory 2. So here we were, Quest for Glory 5, and uh, the same thing was happening all over again, is that uh, all the artwork was being redone from voxels to polygons. Uh, there were major programming changes to go along with the art changes. Uh, and uh, I think we had yet another Sierra. Yeah, of course we had yet another Sierra engine, because at this point we were no longer working with SCI. It was all done in C++, uh, and the... Uh, uh, the development team, the, the, the uh, systems programming team, had taken the systems code and stripped it out of the original games and had, uh, uh, and that was written in a combination of uh, C and assembly language, uh, and they had put that into a C++ framework, but inevitably there were, you know, hundreds and thousands of bugs uh, in that too that had to be worked out while we were doing the game. So I think it was actually three and a half years uh, from the start, and from the design of Quest for Glory 5, remember we had actually proposed this design two years earlier to Sierra. Uh, so there were five or six years that uh, went by in that game where all of our previous games had been done in a year to a year and a half. It was, it was definitely, um, you know, massively over budget uh, and massive amount of work. It gave Lori the opportunity to write vastly more dialogue and story and so on, uh, because that was the easy part. You know, once, you know, she was off in her room doing that and, uh, you know, putting it into a tool that one of the programmers had come up with and was automatically incorporated in the game. Uh, so she kept writing and writing and writing and the uh, uh, game Bible got up to a thousand pages instead of 500. Uh, and eventually we got it all done. Uh, but uh, it was just a, a massive, massive undertaking. And uh, that was the game that was supposed to be out for Christmas. So therefore, Thanksgiving weekend is coming down to the wire in theory and basically we're called in and they want us to QA for that weekend and Corey and I had a vacation planned for Thanksgiving. Well, we had actually timed it out. We had uh, made sure that the game would be done in August. Uh, so, you know, we knew, you know, there's this thing called a reverse calendar uh, that if you want the game to be on the shelves for Christmas, uh, 
at the very latest, you want the game done in October. Uh, and ideally, you want, uh, you want it in production in August in order to hit that October date. So we had planned the game to be done in August. Uh, the game was all done. Uh, two months before we're about, two or three months before we're about to ship, uh, our uh, general manager comes in and he's been playing the game all this time. And he says, well, we need a few small changes. Uh, and we've done all the voice recording at this point. And he said, well, I don't like this voice actor. Uh, you know, her voice is too shrill. You got to re-record that. And oh, by the way, that dialogue is way too risque. We're, we're putting this game in the shelves of Walmart and they're a Christian organization. They won't take the game if it's got that risque language. So uh, we had to start rewriting parts of the game. We had to reprogram parts of it. And all of a sudden that, uh, that August date was a chimera because every time you make any sort of a change like that, it has to go through a, uh, you know, a, a month long, you know, six to 10, eight week uh, QA cycle. Uh, and it kept getting later and later. I said, well, for sure it'll be out before uh, Thanksgiving, because if it isn't out by then, you miss Christmas. You don't have it on the, on the shelves in time for Christmas sales. Thanksgiving is, you know, uh, is or at least used to be the number one shopping uh, games. Uh, and I had, six months ago, won an entry into a National Bridge Championship, uh, and I had planned a vacation uh, to the Bridge Nationals in Orlando, Florida, and it was also going to be a vacation for my son, and Lori and I had uh, non-refundable plane tickets. We had this trip all planned out, uh, and they said, well, you can't go on that. We're going to ship the game. Yes, um, they wanted us to be the, the lead QAers, I mean for yeah. the game, and so therefore we couldn't go on this vacation. And I said, you know, the game isn't ready. It needs at least another six to eight weeks. Uh, you know, being gone for a week is not, you know, us being gone for a week is not going to have a major impact on this. And I said, oh, no, 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 it's ready to go. It's, uh, you know, it just needs a little bit more testing. Uh, so Lori canceled her plane ticket. Uh, uh, I delayed mine. I had to pay an extra $500 or whatever to go three days late and miss the beginning of the tournament. Uh, uh, cut short the vacation. And uh, and then finally, I think you did come out. No, I didn't. Oh, oh, you you got fired. Time. You got fired. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they fired me. They said, okay, well, don't come back at all then. If you, yes. if you insist on going this trip, you're not coming back. Uh, and uh, they proceeded to uh, say, uh, uh, this game's going out the door. You know, We're getting this out. Well, I came back from my trip, and uh, actually it was, uh, it was about to ship. It was about to go into production. The only reason it didn't is at the last second, uh, one of the systems programmers found a bug in the, uh, uh, the new game system and said, you can't ship it yet. We have to fix this first. Uh, and that delayed the game just a few days. And I came back, and I played through it, and I discovered that of the... Uh, 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 for character classes, the game was impossible with character class. No, that no, was that was that was that, five. Corey wasn't. It was it what was two. That was two. So yes. well, it happened again on five because I played through and you could yes, not. Yes, but the real thing that kept it from shipping the day was the day it was going to ship. It was going to be in production. Was the day they discovered that on the Macintosh, which was. The, our, our lead programmer was a Macintosh man. Fanatic. So he was. So this was the baby that he pro programmed on and things like that. The Macintosh. If you use this one spell, you destroyed the whole game. It just locked up. There was nothing. So that day, he found that bug. They had to take that spell out. They effectively just pulled the spell from the game. And it had no special effects. It said it gave you a death message if you actually did it, and that was what it shipped with that day. So that okay. was it. Yep, that was the day after Thanksgiving. Okay, well, not my memory. Yeah, I know. My memory is I came back and uh, they and you said that already. And they, and they still uh, it went another several weeks. Still. It didn't. There wasn't anything I left. They shipped. Should... They shipped that year. So it was like just a mess again, and. It's like, well, so much for that that relationship with that company again. They were not thrilled with us because we decided we would do what we wanted to do and try to get the game well, right. Well, let's talk about the uh, reward for the team because a good friend of ours uh, was also working as a contractor there, uh, and uh, uh, he had also planned uh, planned on going on vacation, and he canceled his. Lori canceled hers, uh, and. 
you know, I got fired as a result of going on vacation and insisting that I had that right. Uh, well, uh, a month later, uh, maybe it's even two weeks later, the game was out the door. They immediately laid off the entire programming team, uh, including, uh, you know, this guy who had uh, basically, uh, you know, sacrificed his plans to go on this. Uh, they kept Lori on for another couple months uh, to uh, clean up stuff. Uh, but, uh, you know, as soon as the game was gone, uh, they fired the entire team. Uh, they basically uh, said, uh, you know, we can't keep you on the books. The overhead's too high. Uh, and uh, that was the kind of the beginning of the end uh, for Sierra. It wasn't, it wasn't just us. We weren't the cause of it. But every one of the games that Sierra was doing at this point was going through similar experiences of major cost runs, reinventing the wheel on game engines. Uh, uh, the uh, King's Quest they were working in time had the same sort of problems up in Seattle. Uh, the uh, game they were doing in uh, Gabriel Knight was going through the same kind of problems. Yeah, but all of our all three teams were re were trying to create their own engine and get a game out at the same time. So, and uh, you know, we know now that uh, basically we were pikers because uh, uh, we thought that a two million dollar budget was you know incredible and through the roof. Now games are costing ten, twenty million dollars or more. Uh, and they're taking three to five years, but at the time, Sierra, you know, just was not equipped for that uh, sort of thing. They, you know, they could not imagine that there was any point at all to doing a game that couldn't be shipped in a year or a year and a half at most. Uh, so the world was changing around them, and they weren't ready for it. You know, it's a tragic ending for a really glorious series. I have to to know: Have you thought about making a sixth game? Well, we kept saying that, you know, that would be like putting your head in the nose voluntarily. <laughs> and yet we've always thought about it. And of course, we'd love to do it. Uh, but there's a little issue of uh, all the work we did for Sierra was done to work for hire basis. Uh, Sierra owned the license to all that. We actually, Craig Alexander tried to make a deal with us uh, at the very end of uh, development on Quest for Glory 5, uh, or maybe shortly after, I guess. He called us into his office. And we, at that point, had talked about uh, doing some uh, add-on packs. Oh, we, no, to do the multiplayer well, version. Yeah, it was the multiplayer. Because it shipped without yeah. the multiplayer version after all that time. So we were going to do that as an add-on. And, you know, we uh, worked with Bob Heitman. Uh, and we talked with Craig because we were going to do this kind of an independent project under contract to Sierra. And, unfortunately, the numbers didn't work out. We looked at uh, what the cost would be and the experience of, like, the... Uh, Wing Commander add-ons and so on is that they sold uh, between 20 and 50 percent of the original game sales, and we looked at what the cost would be for development and said basically uh, we can't practically do this. And so Craig offered us an alternative. He said, "If you will give up uh, your royalties for this game and all of your previous games, I think I can negotiate a deal with, uh, and I can broker a deal with Sierra where you will get back uh, the rights." Uh, so that you will have the license to make any Quest for Glory games you want in the future. And at the time we said, well, that's what we're living on. I don't see that we can do that. And if we'd had a crystal ball, we would have learned that over the uh, course of the uh, couple years after that, I think we ended up getting a total of $20,000 from, uh, uh, from all those royalties. And so for $20,000, maybe we could have had the uh, rights in the series and it would be ours. But at the time... You know, we thought that we were talking about $100,000 or more uh, and that that was going to be our livelihood uh, while we were now both out of work. Uh, and so we said, we just can't do this. Uh, but uh, since then, you know, a couple of times we, we approached Activision. or No, it wasn't Activision at the time. It was a, yeah, it went to Havas uh, uh, International. Then it went to Vivendi. And then it went to Activision Blizzard. Uh, and... Uh, we talked to a couple of those companies and said, you know, we'd like to license uh, rights back so we can do another Quest for Glory. Uh, and they basically said, well, we're not really interested in licensing it. Uh, this is intellectual properties. Uh, we may want to do something with this at some point. So we really don't want to have a, uh, an outside game done. And they're done. Yeah. Uh, we've talked to a couple of companies uh, that I can't mention the names of, but uh, at least one company did obtain a license from... Uh, uh, from Vivendi, and was planning on doing uh, uh, a game with, a, with it, but they were doing another Sierra game first and wanted to see how that sold. Uh, and so sometime in the future, they were going to bring us in to help them out with it, and then that kind of died on the vine. Uh, 
And another company uh, has been actively negotiating uh, with uh, Activision for the rights to both uh, King's Quest and Quest for Glory. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's all somewhere in the future. In the meantime, we kind of need to eat. Yeah. <laughs> in real life, we need to, uh, to earn a living. And we've been doing the School for Heroes thing for the last six years. And that's been purely a labor of love. Uh, we, it has no... Uh, monetary uh, yeah, value. No, no monetary value. No, uh, uh, no way of making money from it. We could have probably put a button on there that said donate. And we said, well, that would sort of cheese it out. <laughs> Uh, so we've been donating our time to the fans for six years uh, and, uh, you know, living off of uh, uh, our savings and living off money for the family and so on. And we said, you know, if we want to make another game, and we do, uh, we've got to find a way to actually uh, uh, make money from it. And we said, but we don't know how to do that. We don't have a big company behind us. Uh, you know, Sierra automatically could get 100,000 copies of the game on the shelves and nobody else could. Most games that go out are dismal failures and lose money. Uh, and independent games uh, were impossible to get noticed. And then all of a sudden, Tim Schafer shows up and does uh, the Kickstarter campaign for Double Fine Adventure. And people say, yeah, bring back adventures. We want them. And contributed, I think, what, five times what he asked for? And we said, well, maybe, just maybe we can do that. And we had all, all kinds of fans coming to us and say, look what Tim Schafer did. And we said, well, yeah, well, that's Tim Schafer. Uh, and he stayed in the industry in the meantime. Uh, how do people even, you know, does anybody even know who we are anymore? Uh, how would we get people to find our Kickstarter and find us? And, you know, for six months we talked about it. And finally people said, you know, you got to do this. And we said, yeah, you know, we got to do this. And it would be nice to be able to uh, pay our mortgage without having to rely on uh, the uh, kindness of strangers. <laughs> but more to the point, everything started to come together. We started, we found uh, a great company in Australia that was doing an adventure game and and then did a puzzle game that's called Brossom and they did Jolly Rover and they did uh, uh, MacGuffin's Curse. These were fun games and it's, we, we contacted them because they contacted us and said well what if we used your engine to create a new kind of game and it's like, wow, yes, this is really working. And they've got a great musician over there. And we've got an art group here that's going to be incredible. And it's like all of a sudden all the pieces started to fit into the puzzle of the timing's getting right. The uh, momentum is building. We've got all the people we need in place. And we can do this ourselves. We don't need this huge company. All we have to do is convince our fans that what we will do will be fun. Yeah, and that it will have value to them and that, uh, you know, they want to contribute not because they're giving us money, but because they know that uh, they're going to get a game that they would never see otherwise. And uh, this model didn't exist until this year. If you look at, uh, you know, gaming and Kickstarter in 2011, it was hardly anything. And all of a sudden in 2012... Uh, people are saying, yeah, we want these games that have intelligence, that have real story, that have, uh, you know, gameplay, that have puzzles, that will make me think, uh, and that will be involving and interactive. And, and aren't just a, 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 another shooter or another massively multiplayer right. game. Because we said 12 years ago, okay, yeah, I know those first-person shooters are cool, and you could probably do two or three games like that. Well... What we've had over the last 12 years is almost nothing but. Uh, and, the, you know, it's just, it's, it's like a, it's a fun once. Uh, and uh, adventure games and role-playing games are so much richer because every one has its own story. Each one is a new game. And it's not just, uh, you know, how fast you can, you can click the mouse. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the time is right for this. And just all the pieces uh, fall into place like the stars are aligning and, uh, Andrew Golding actually had contacted me in 2010 uh, with Jolly Rover and said, hey, I did this new game and I'm, you know, it was inspired by looking at Quest for Glory uh, and uh, I'd like you to look at it. And I played and it was fun and uh, it's great, but we didn't really want to do an adventure game. You know, adventure games are, not, you know, as we said, not really where we're at. It's the combination of adventure and role playing that to us gives the adrenaline, the excitement and the many things to do and the feeling of growth of your protagonist. He's not just a a fixed entity, but he's really learning something as he goes through the game and 
of becoming uh, a better person for it. Uh, so when Andrew shipped me his, you know, sent me his latest game this year and said, here's this new thing I've done, MacGuffin's Curse, uh, we played and said, oh my God, that game's fun. And it's really smart. It's got puzzles and it's enjoyable. And we can see taking that tile interface that this game used, and that's something that within a reasonable art budget uh, that we don't have to spend $10 million to make a game. We don't even have to spend $2 million. Uh, that for a few hundred thousand dollars, we can get all of our story in there, you know, as long as we're barely scraping by. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, we can make the game that we want to make in terms of uh, story and puzzles and so on. And if, uh, you know, if the fans are really into it and say that, uh, yeah, we really, you know, we really believe in you, uh, we really want to see this, you know, then the art budget will go up, the design budget will go up. Uh, uh, and we'll be able to put in more stuff. We'll be able to put in voices, uh, and we'll be able to have more uh, backgrounds. We have uh, Eric Chang uh, at, uh, art directing for us, and he's actually uh, started out as a fan, uh, uh, but he's a you know professional graphic designer. But he worked with the uh, AGDI team doing the Quest for Glory 2 remake. And he did the poster for him and did some of the art lead in the project. Uh, and, you know, he was just blown away at the opportunity to work with us. And that was actually Andrew's uh, suggestion that we bring in Eric. Uh, and we said, okay, well, you know, the poster's pretty good and so on. And then Eric sends us his pencil sketch of uh, one of the rooms of the game. We're like, oh, my God, that's beautiful. And uh, Ryan Grogan comes in with, uh, uh, you know, we talked to him about what we wanted for a theme music uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the Kickstarter video and for the game theme. And he comes up with this thing, and we say... If that was in a movie, I don't care what the movie's about. I'd watch the movie just to hear that music. So, and yeah. it's, it's, just, it's just amazing uh, that people are coming out of the woodwork and they want to help and they're good. Mm -hmm. So we're really, really excited about what Hero You will be. And, of course, it isn't just one game because we just don't do one game. We've got <laughs> this series envisioned that will take across, you know, all... The, the character classes, rather than combine them all into one character that can be a magic user or a thief or whatever, this time you, you get to be play the rogue character. Then you get to play the magic user character. And the experience is totally different because they're going to do different things. They're not going to run through the same storyline that you ran through like the Quest for Glory series did. It's going to be same area. But all of a sudden, you're not dealing with the same way or the same kind of problems or the same people. So each game will be uniquely its own. And I, I like to think of it as kind of more like uh, Downton Abbey. You know, it's all set in the same place, but you watch different aspects, different characters, and you're just as involved with each different character. And you'll do this with this game. There'll be, you know, you're going through the rogue story, but you'll meet people from the other stories too and eventually you get to follow their story and find out where that one goes well another way of looking at it is that uh hero you and the school for heroes uh is like a book uh, you can take a thousand different books and on the surface they all look the same they're all you know have a binding they're made out of paper they got a bunch of words in them maybe some illustrations but each one tells a different story and is a unique experience uh, so we're going to keep our, uh, our art budget within reason uh, by having a single setting, which is the Hero University. Uh, but within that, there's a million different stories we could tell. And we're going to tell five of them. Uh, and with each story, uh, you're going to get completely different dialogue, uh, a, completely, you know, a complete different character experience, new abilities. Uh, and you will go through uh, and... Even though the environment is similar, uh, you're going to be doing completely different things each game and experiencing a new story. And all these stories, however, will tie together so that you're getting, uh, there's a, a much wider world. It's the tip of an iceberg because we've got an iceberg of a background of a story and political systems and the whole world behind this game. And you're going to see a little corner of it as your rogue character, the tip of the iceberg. And when you came, come back in the second game and play as a wizard character, it's going to continue. It's going to assume that the player has played the first game and has some insider knowledge about it. Uh, but you're a new character that has entirely different reason for being at the school and her own secrets. Uh, 
that you know that uh, the rest of the people of the school don't know. Uh, and we're not doing like an amnesia game. The player knows what's going on, but at the same time, there's mysteries that the player doesn't know uh, about, about why the character is there and so on. So, yes, we're going to create an no, a entirely different game experience than, you know, than any other game is out there right now. We don't want to reinvent what we've already done. We want to, with every Quest for Glory game, we were doing something new and something creative. Well, this is something different, yet it has the same kind of impact in terms of you really care about the story. You really care about those characters. And there's quirkiness, there's humor, and yet there's this underlying idea that really there's something nasty going on. You need to solve the problem. You need to deal with it. And it becomes personalized. It's the player really feeling like they need to do this. And another reason we're putting the focus on the, uh, the story and the characters instead of on uh, uh, more art and, uh, and so on. I mean, we'll, we'll have more art, of course. But the reason we're doing this also is uh, uh, production schedules. Uh, we're going to get the first game out. It's probably going to take us close to a year. Uh, but we're hoping that we can do each of the other games in about six months each. And that way, uh, there'll be episodic adventures. The players will not be waiting uh, three years in between games. They'll really be able to get the experience of being able to play them all in a row. Uh, and the fifth game, if we actually manage to get that far, I mean, this is a dream, you know, if, that we'll actually get that far. But if we make it to the fifth game, the fifth game is going to let you play all the characters. It's going to bring it all together, and, to, and you'll get the the uh, you know, stunning conclusion of the story, uh, and you'll be switching back and forth, and you'll be the rogue part of the time and the wizard part of the time, and you'll need to use everybody's skills and abilities uh, and their knowledge in order to be able to uh, you know, fight an evil that is so powerful that no character by themselves would ever be able to handle it. So that's what we're doing with Hero U. Well, I wish you best of luck. You can definitely count me in. Oh, that I'm really psyched. Well, is there anything else you wanted to mention or comment about? Oh, uh, we love the fans. If, you know, and uh, and you're part of this. It's it's Hero You because this is your game, and we're going to have a website that uh, we'll have people contributing design ideas. Probably having some contests up, uh, contests up there in our uh, copious free time when we're not designing the game and uh, managing the team. Uh, but uh, you know, we're here. We're back because the fans demanded it. And, uh, you know, we love you, and uh, you are what gives us the energy to make these games. So yeah. this is going to be a real collaboration. As he said, we've had very hard times at Sierra and, and, and doing games. It is not an easy thing to do. But all along the way, we would get a letter or a comment from somebody that was a fan saying, this made a difference in my life, that honestly, this game impacted the way their lives went, whether it was behind the Iron Curtain, we would get letters from fans who had pirated copies when there was still a Soviet Union that controlled that area, saying that it was like being able to go into another world. I was taken out of this depressing life that I lived, and I became somebody different. Yeah, they said our games gave them hope, and our games taught them English, uh, and, you know, Quest for Glory 4, we got letters from people in, uh, uh, you know, in that area in the Urals and so on saying, this is real. You've got Papa Yaga in there and you've got, you know, the legends of my childhood. And this is, you know, I can imagine my land being Mordavian. And when we talked about Rasir, they talked about their repressive government. I mean, we've made a difference in the world with our games and that to us uh, makes us proud of anything. We could just be doing entertainment, but our entertainment, we think, has real value to the world and to people. And we want to keep doing that. And we really do appreciate the people who have said, you know, this is what is it, the difference it's made in my life. And that is why we are willing to do this again. It's because yeah. that, that we know that people not only have fun, but they experience it in the way we wanted them to experience it, that it's more than just a game. Anything you do in life affects you. Yep. It makes you grow. It changes you. And so if you're playing a game, that game better have some value in it. It shouldn't just be entertainment. It should really help you 
learn how to deal with life. Yeah, when uh, John F. Kennedy started the Apollo program and said that, uh, you know, uh, he was putting forth this challenge that we would put a man on the moon uh, before the uh, end of the decade. Uh, it was considered impossible at the time, but one of the things he said in that speech was, uh, you know, to paraphrase, we're not doing this because it's uh, an easy thing. We're doing this because it is hard. We're doing it because it's important. Uh, and for us, we're going to be working unbelievably hard on this. And everybody in the team is going to be, uh, you know, killing themselves to get this game out. But we're doing it because it is hard. Other people are not doing games like this because they're not easy. And we want to show that games can be more than just momentary entertainment, that they can be exciting and immersive and really, uh, you know, make people into heroes. And the world needs heroes. A game can help make heroes. We're going to show that to the world. As long as you promise not to turn it into a first-person shooter, that's the... <laughs> Well, okay, uh, just for you. I mean, we were going to do that, but, but Matt, because, because you have so much influence on us, by the way, we love your program, uh, that uh, uh, just for you, we won't make it a first-person shooter. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, we're going to have uh, turn-based tactical combat uh, to the extent we can. We want to really make it so that there are real decisions to be made uh, without taking too long. There's, there's a lot of stuff we've got. Uh, you know, we, we've put the hours into this project already. That's... We, you know, we know where we're going with it, and we're really excited about the gameplay. It's going to be fun. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a brand new retrospective. And I've only got about four of these uh, uh, suggestions sitting in the queue. So remember, guys, I depend on you to uh, suggest games for the show. Uh, you can't just add a comment here, though. I actually need you to record a brief video, just 10 to 20 seconds. Uh, just tell me who you are, or your first name, uh, where you're from, and the game you want me to look at, and I will add it to the list. Only got about four games there, so there's a really good chance to get your game on the show. Uh, so please uh, take a minute to do that. I think it really adds some spice <laughs> to the show. Uh, speaking of spice, what about that ale of the week? Now this week I have a very special selection sent to me all the way from Portugal, from Bruno, and this is the Superbach Stout, supposedly uh, the best beer in the world, or so I've been told. Uh, now this is, uh, bottle is from Portugal, so it's written in Portuguese. Uh, fortunately for you, my Portuguese is excellent. So I will now read this to you. Uh, Superbach Stout e a cerveja preta especial, feita com maltes seleccionados que la conferam um sabor intenso e uma espuma cremoso, cremosa e duradora, which uh, roughly translated equals uh, damn good beer. Uh, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I'm here with this Superbach Stout in the old drinking where I've been smelling it and uh, listening to it, everything but tasting it. Uh, so far I'm impressed. It doesn't quite smell like other stouts that I've had before. There's just a, a faint, uh, sort of faint caramel coffee-like uh, smell that you get with these, but there's something else in this. Uh, there's some other element in the aroma that I haven't detected uh, before in other stouts or really other beers. I'm kind of excited about that. Maybe there's something, there is something peculiar or special about a Portuguese uh, stout that you just can't get uh, using water from other places. So here's to you, Bruno. Uh, let's give this a taste. Hmm. What's going on with that? Uh, there's definitely some effects <laughs> getting from this uh, stout. There's like a, a very uh, complicated aftertaste. Uh, three or four flavors kind of hit you all at once. Uh, let me try it again. You sort of get this sort of chocolatey, uh, like a Mississippi mud-like uh, flavor, kind of sweet, chocolatey, a little bit of uh, it's not quite coffee. It's like a kind of roasted almonds uh, sort of flavor there. 
It's not a very thick or heavy beer. <clears throat> I don't know how to describe this flavor to you. It's not quite... It's not quite like coffee. It's not quite like a chocolate. It's it's sort of hitting hitting a lot of those same registers, uh, but not not exact. It just kind of has its own flavor. It's uh, very hard to uh, describe, unfortunately. Uh, but is it good? I think this is quite good. A very interesting uh, stout. You know, a lot of guys that go in for. Uh, exotic brews, they don't want to taste something that tastes just like a Budweiser, right? You want something with its own uh, characteristics, and I definitely think this uh, fits the bill. Quite exotic, quite interesting. Uh, not very strong, uh, not, a lot, not a lot of uh, alcohol uh, that hits you with this. I don't know what the uh, exact alcoholic content is with this. But anyway, quite good. I don't know about best beer in the world, <laughs> you know? uh, but I would definitely recommend this. I'm going to go four out of five drinking horns on this one. Uh, a really good choice. It's really interesting. If you want something besides the usual sort of Guinness stouts that are uh, available everywhere, uh, seek out this super box stout from Portugal, and I think you'll be impressed with it. Now let's uh, wrap up with a quotation, and I just saw that new, uh, new movie, Lincoln, so I found a quotation from the, uh, the former, our former president, and it goes uh, something like this. Give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the axe. See you guys next week. The strawberries taste like strawberries. The snozberries taste like snozberries. Snozberries? Who ever heard of a snozberry? We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams.